cannot tell you how grateful I am for what you do. Um, one of the essences and themes of Grant's College is that we believe in social justice and we believe in the Jewish concept of Tikkun Olam, making the world better, repairing the world. And there is no better way to repair the world than to remind the world about past horrors so that we can make sure that they never happen again. And so this Holocaust teaching is not merely a history lesson, but it's a lesson in how to make sure that future generations don't have to teach about subsequent genocides and subsequent Holocausts. One of the key programs that we have at grants today is a master's degree and a PhD in Holocaust and Genocide Studies. And we do this because it is now more important than ever to teach about this. Uh, in this context, I would like to recognize Josie Fisher, who is sitting somewhere, and she hates me when I do this, but I'm going to ask her to stand. So we can... She has been a leader of Holocaust education for more than 30 years. With her is a very large staff, uh, which again, if the staff members would like to stand up, uh, it is worth it because you're really important. Uh, <laughs> collecting the interviews. These are not short, you know, 20 minute interviews. Some of them are three days of taped interviews. They have been interviewing survivors, they have been interviewing rescuers, they have been interviewing other people who were involved in the Holocaust in various ways. Our archive, more than 900 taped interviews, is the second largest in the world, and all over the world we get requests to be connected to what we have. Currently, we are trying to take all of the taped interviews and transcribe them, which is an unbelievably difficult task, which these volunteers come and do every week, uh, so that the whole world can share and understand this. I would also like to thank my team here at Grants. Um, as president of the college, I have very, very few powers. Uh, my most important power is that I can get most of you to be quiet when I come to the microphone, and I can close the school on a snow day. And last spring, I was able to bestow an doc honorary doctorate on Josie, so she's actually Dr. Fisher. And um, <laughs> but what really makes the college work are the people who are here who do the job every day. And I just want to thank a number of them personally. Mindy Cohen, Lori Cohen, uh, not related, but they're still the Cohen sisters. Dodi Klimoff, uh, Alisa Landry, Suzette Quills, Bashir Bronson, Ernie Collins, and Naomi Houston have all been incredibly instrumental in putting this together. However, the key player is the other Mindy, Mindy Blackburn. And I'd like Mindy to stand. Almost everybody <laughs> Mindy is the one who makes this happen. Very shortly after I arrived, I was ordered into a meeting with Mindy to talk about what's going on with the Tasman program for this year. And I'm sure that next week she will tell me we have a meeting to plan one for two years from now. Um, Mindy was one of the key players in creating the Masters and the Doctorate in Holocaust Studies. Uh, we also have with us Dr. Monica Rice, who is the new director of our uh, Holocaust and Genocide Studies mm -hmm. program. We have Jeff Benvenuto, mm -hmm. who is an expert on the American, American Genocide, who teaches for us. Jenny Marlowe, who's come all the way from Tennessee, who teaches for us. Uh, and they have joined us. Uh, our new intern, Dean Honor Moore, is here. And I also want to recognize David Weinstein, who is giving a talk later today but is the former uh, chair of the Board of Governors of Grads College and continues to serve uh, on the Grads College Board of Governors. Out in the hall, there's an enormous amount of information uh, which can weigh you down as you leave on many of the programs at Grads College. 
In addition to the Holocaust and genocide programs, we have a doctorate in education. We have a number of master's degrees in education. Uh, some of them are Holocaust and Jewish connected, many of them are not. If you know people who are teaching and need to get their master's event, the beauty of doing it at Gratz is it's almost entirely done online. They can do it from their living room or their bedroom or their kitchen uh, on their own time uh, while they're continuing to do their job. And again, Gratz is about to celebrate its 125th anniversary in two years from now. We began as a college of education. We began educating Hebrew teachers. There was a time when most of the Hebrew teachers in this part of the country, but all the way up and all the way down the East Coast, had got to Gratz. When I became president, I called a number of people I know in this industry, including my friend Alan Dershowitz, and I told Alan I'm the new president of Grants College. He said, my uncle went there. <laughs> Didn't know when, but he knew why his uncle went there. Everywhere I go, I meet somebody who went to Grants, whose uncle went to Grants, whose aunt went to Grants. We are still a college of education. This is what we do. We educate people, we educate teachers, we teach teachers, we prepare teachers to teach about the Holocaust. Uh, and I thank all of you for your support in making this mission of grants possible. We also have a um, program for people who teach in Sunday in Hebrew schools. Uh, it is called Jewish Sacramental School Teachers. Uh, it's known as the NEXT program. And so what we provide is the the backup, the benefit, the intellectual ammunition for teachers around the country who are teaching something and don't know quite how to teach it or need some help, they can take a short course with us and we can help them do what they need to do, again, to spread knowledge. Finally, we continue to teach high school students in the Jewish community high school, something that goes back as far as the beginning of grass. Uh, and so again, I thank all of you for coming. I hope you will look at some of our programs, share the information, and learn much from the day. And now I want to introduce Marty Tusman, who has become a friend as well as a supporter of Gratz, and somebody who I'm very proud to consider part of the Gratz family. Marty. I'm really honored to have this honor to speak on behalf of my family, and most importantly, my parents, and the many, many that shared my parents' faith, my parents' lives, and uh, the incredible experiences that we remember today. Artifacts and memories. We gather to remember, and we gather to ensure that we never forget. <coughs> Artifacts and Memory seems to speak to stories and issues from a long time past. My parents Arnold and Esther Tusman survived the Holocaust. My mother was only one, the only one to survive from a large family. For much of the war, she feared she was the only Jew that survived, and she would speak about that to us, fearing that when and if the war was over, if she survived, She'd be the only Jew left and not know how to live. My father had a brother that was fortunate enough to get to Israel before the war, and one brother who survived the war with him at his side. The rest of his large family was lost. My parents told brutal stories, but so much more frightening as a child and through my life were the imaginations of the stories they didn't tell. Artifacts and memories. I was consumed as a young teacher, teenager, to fill in the blanks, to read everything I could from my Kampf to the rise and fall of the Third Reich as a 13, 14 year old boy. A quote by George Santayana has stuck with me throughout the years and has guided the path that we are all on here today. He who forgets the past is condemned to relive it. Would that our discussions were artifacts and memories, long buried in the past. 
Would that we could be sure that we have learned all the messages and heard all the stories that we needed to be sure that we would never allow it to be relived. I find myself, as I'm sure we all do, so disturbed by the horrible and tragic events we experience, the nature of our dialogue, and the blood that is shed and the hatred that is bantered. We have a scary discourse of hatred and nationalism today in our country and our world like I've never seen in my life when I was born in the shadows of the Holocaust. That was a pogrom, a horrible and brutal massacre in Squirrel Hill only a few short weeks ago. Judah Somet survived the Holocaust, kept alive by stale breadcrumbs fed by his mother. He watched the Nazi hold a gun to his mother's head but reconsider and spare her so she could be an interpreter. A few weeks ago, again, he was barely spared, but 11 of his friends met their death in Pittsburgh by the gun of another crazy Jew hater. Not that this pathology is limited to Jews. This murderer spewed hatred for Jews in Hyas, the organization that recovered so many Jews from pogroms in Eastern Europe and on the heels of the Holocaust and throughout the world. I am proud to be on the board of Hyas Philadelphia, whose focus used to be recovering Jews, but now welcomes the stranger from around the world who is suffering today in political turmoil and displacement, and as Jews were decades ago. Hyas lives tikkun olam as its motto to repair the world. We see a caravan of displaced and suffering, tired and poor, yearning for a better life, being met by a closed wall in armed military, and are reminded of the ship, the St. Louis, with Jews going from country to country, whose borders were closed, and the Jews returned to Germany, where many faced their death. Is this artifact and memory, or our contemporary reality, Charlottesville, a black church in Charleston. In Yemen, 10,000 civilians have been killed and 14 million face starvation. 14 million. A gay nightclub in Florida and a college nightclub in California. Have we seen such hatred and demented anger and violence in recent years? Birthright citizenship is now advocated. It was in the Aryan nation as well. Artifacts and memories, they serve as guideposts to the future and warning signs and teaching moments, which is what we do here today. The Philadelphia Holocaust Memorial Plaza opened last month at 16th in the Parkway. I heard a survivor who's here today, Annalise Nasbaum. She's with us today. Wave your hand. Yeah. Speak of a tree that is planted there from saplings from a tree of a, the concentration camp in Theresienstadt, and tracks that are there from a train to Treblinka, artifacts, and also cautionary guideposts and warning signs for our future. The National Liberty Museum here in Philadelphia delivers its message delivered a message recently, or delivers its message regularly, that liberty is like glass, that our freedom and civilization are delicate and fragile and must be carefully handled. The National Museum of American Jewish History proclaimed in recent days, we must teach because education is stronger than hate. Many stories, many artifacts and many memories, and too, too many still being lived today. Those who don't learn from the past are condemned to relive it. Today we are here to teach and to learn, so we don't ever forget. Our family is honored to support the important work of Gratz and its scholars, and all of you that are here today. We welcome Dr. Lucker. And we welcome you all today. Thank you. Now, uh, after that, I'm going to speech. Thank you. 
Now it's my honor to introduce to you Stephen Lockhart, who is the senior program curator at the Levine Institute for Holocaust Education at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C. He has served at the museum for 20 years as a curator, and uh, he was one of the key curators of the main exhibition of the Holocaust. In addition, he curated eight special programs, including State of Deception, The Power of Nazi Propaganda. The book based on that exhibit is available for sale here uh, afterwards. And uh, if Stephen hand, Stephen's hand still holds out, he'll be able to sign a few more. Uh, Stephen has appeared in media outlets all over the United States, C-SPAN, CNN, NBC Night News, Associated Press, Reuters, History Detectives, The History Channel, Huffington Post, German TV, PBS, Fox, Washington Post, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, the list goes on and on, National Geographic, Iran Wire, al -Hura, The Atlantic, The Jewish Telegram Agency, and TASS, and many others have interviewed him live or on paper. Um, he is a rock star in the world of Holocaust studies. Uh, I have a slight personal bias here because when Steve was much, much younger and had more hair, and I was much, much younger and had a lot more hair, he was my teaching assistant and my graduate research assistant while he was working on his PhD. Um, the highest honor that you can have as a scholar and a teacher is to welcome your students who've gone on to do wonderful things. And so it's my delightful honor to welcome Steve. Well, thank you for that very wonderful introduction. And I want, I want to thank the Tusman family for all that they've done. This is truly a remarkable uh, gathering, and I think it's such an important event. Uh, I also want to, when I was, I also want to say something about Grads College, because coming here has been kind of like rejoining the family, because I've met a lot of familiar faces, I've met some new faces, but in many ways, we're all engaged in the same mission, that is to preserve memory. And I was thinking about, in talking with Josie, and Josie reminded me that when the, they began collecting oral testimonies here, about 1979, I started thinking back about my own past, and about my museum's past. Now they date from about the same time. Because it was at that time as an undergraduate that I was first studying Holocaust history. This, is, this was a time period in which, I don't know if you remember, the made-for-TV drama, The Holocaust, starring Meryl Streep and James Woods and Fritz Weaver and, and Tova uh, Felschu and various other people, uh, created quite a stir, not only in the United States, but uh, across the world. And that was kind of one of the emphasis for President Jimmy Carter to establish this commission on the Holocaust, which eventually led to the creation of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. So in many ways, I thought it was kind of interesting, this intertwining of different things, both you know my own personal interest in this topic and, and scholarly study of it, the collection that began here, this important collection of oral testimonies, and the creation of the museum, all dedicated in some ways to preserving memory. And I think about all the importance of doing that. We're living in a time in which we're seeing the passing of the, the, the very sad passing of the surviving generation. We're also seeing the passing of many of the American soldiers, for instance, who went into the Nazi camps and talked about those experiences and documented them. So we're losing that group of uh, people. We're also finding ourselves living in a time period, not only in which there's hatred, but there's denial and also even more prominently distortion of the Holocaust. One of the projects that I'm currently working on is looking at Holocaust distortion in Europe, and it's widespread. 
And this is something that I think by preserving memory, getting that message out is going to be important in combating both this amnesia and also reminding people about the importance of this history. Now, it's been wonderful here actually to talk about, to meet some of the graduate students, some of the teachers, some of the, the faculty here that are also interested in keeping this memory alive. And I think that that is, is crucial for our future generations. We're going to have to come up with new ways to engage audiences with this history. In an era in which people are used to 140 or so characters, where the, the amount of reading that visitors to museums spend has precipitously declined in the years that I've been a curator. And we have to find new ways of using the internet to, to sh share this memory globally with people from throughout the world, putting it in different languages, making it accessible. I was in Belgium recently, and I met with a group of people, young Europeans, and some from outside Europe, who are interested in combating anti-Semitism and racism. And one of those individuals was from Sri Lanka. He had settled in, in Brussels, and he told me, he said, you know, in many parts of Asia, Hitler's a good guy. <laughs> that he's looked at in a very positive way. They don't see the negative aspects because they've never been taught about them. And sometimes you see it, there's Hitler on screen, for instance, and in, in, uh, that you could find in India, various stores. And, and in some cases, very positive views of what the Nazis did. And so he asked me, he said, you know, that's where you need to be working. We tend to forget about it, but there are plenty of places in the world in which don't have a uh, Holocaust education, don't have mem personal memories of this history. And often what history they have is a kind of d uh, falsified or distorted history of this past. So I think it's important to think about these things both in, a, in, uh, in, in not only in a national sense, but in a global sense. Well, if I could go to the first, <coughs> I can go one more. I don't know if you can see this. Um, museum, Holocaust museums are kind of storehouses of memories. And I'll get you a little difficult to okay. hear you because you're away from the mic. Okay. Can you put the mic in an area where we can hear you better? Because it's having difficult to hear you. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. okay. Yes. All right. Yeah, this is perfect. Um, is that better? Yes. Okay, excellent. All right. Can we get the lights on? The headlight. Are we turning the lights down? Well, uh, all right. Sometimes you have, when you're working as a curator, you come into contact with some wonderful artifacts. And the museum gets artifacts and documents every week, sometimes donated by survivors, families of survivors, families of American soldiers, and others. Now, sometimes those, those objects are layered in memory. And that can be photographs, that can be, that can be film footage, that can be documents. And sometimes as curators, we have to kind of tease out those secrets and get, the, and, and get that information out to the, the public. Now I want to show you this photograph. This was a, a, an image that we used in an exhibition that I co-curated on Hidden Children. Now, uh, this we found, you know, in reading about this and, and looking at this, this object, I was intrigued by it. Uh, it was taken in a uh, Polish convent school in the 1940s, around 1942, 1943. And it was kind of a remarkable photograph. I don't know if you can see, uh, do you notice anything odd about this? And maybe you can't see it because of the, the, uh, because of the the, um, the the way this this image is conveyed, but does anybody notice anything kind of 
odd about this photograph? What was that? Okay, all girls. Well, except for the guy. But, uh, okay, some are facing the camera. Yeah. Okay, very interesting. And we'll come back to that. You probably can't see it, but you see there's a nun there, and behind it, there's a head, but the face is scratched up. Now, when we looked at this photograph close up, what you see is that the face is scratched out with a, a fountain pen. And we found this very intriguing, and what the story is, is that that girl was told by the nuns she looked too Jewish. That is, these, this convent school was hiding Jewish girls among the, the, the Polish uh, Catholic girls that were attending it. And so the nuns feared that this girl, you know, that they told her, you can't have your picture taken anymore. And, you know, you can imagine, the, the, or you, it's probably difficult to imagine what was going through that girl's uh, mind. This was, uh, this was Lita Kleinman who donated this photograph and many others to the museum. But it struck us about how, the, how much this tells about that time period, about the Holocaust and the experience of hidden children. Uh, that one girl that someone pointed out that's looking straight in the camera that looks kind of different, she's also one of, a, a Jewish girl that's in hiding. The nuns there had trained these girls to how to say prayers, how to behave like a Catholic, because there's always a danger that they would be discovered. Because the Nazis, the Nazis were very clever. They would go into these conflicts because they knew Jews were being hidden. It wasn't, it wasn't a surprise to them that Jewish parents would want to save their kids. They would go into these places. Sometimes they would speak German. So does anybody understand? And sometimes that they would do this to trick kids, Jewish kids who understood Yiddish or German, because they would come, they would understand what they're saying. You know, there are other ways, for instance, for boys. You know, they would, they would check if, some, if a boy was circumcised or not. Because that was an, also a giveaway. But they would, also, they would also test kids on these prayers. If they knew those, as a way of discovering those. And you have to remember that for the Nazis, that search to find Jewish kids lasted until the very end of the war. We know that, for instance, in the Netherlands, 1944, as they're being driven out, they're, they have gangs of local collaborators going out to find Jews. And the same thing in Germany, too, and then elsewhere, that they're paid to locate Jews. And so they go into schools and they say, okay, this, so there's something suspicious about this kid. Sometimes they don't know if they're Jewish or whatever, but they, but they round these kids up. But you also have the threat that these nuns fear, which is the penalty after 19, November 1941 in Poland and various other places, is that if you're caught hiding or giving aid to Jews, that's a death penalty. So it's not just a risk for that child, it's the risk for all the others. So you can see the uh, you can see the mentality of the nun who's saying, you know, we you know you appear Jewish, you know we should you don't have your picture taken, and and so it, it tells us a lot about the experience of, of hidden children that theirs was kind of a life in shadows where they could be easily exposed, and we tend not we tend to forget about this, but they could be exposed by their fellow classmates, they could be exposed by neighbors, or they could be discovered by the Nazis. That is, and you're talking about people that have to survive for years, you know, with that fear and, and trying to uh, try to hide out. Well, let me go to the next slide. And this is our, the largest artifact that we have in, in the permanent exhibition. 
And this is a rail car that was donated to the museum by the Polish State Railways. And this, you can see this, this was had to be lowered into the museum building before the roof was put on. And so this was quite a, a, a remarkable undertaking. But here we have a, a, a quite a, you know, an object that conjures up all kinds of memories. If we go to the next slide, and this is showing that rail car being loaded into the into uh, into the building itself, and there are the, the the wheels of the, the rail car. But when we were first looking at this, this uh, when my colleagues were first looking at this object, there was a question, of course, of authenticity. You know, there was no way uh, that we were told by various people, oh, yes, it was used during the Holocaust. Other people said, well, we're not too sure. Ultimately, we decided to say it was of the type that was used. And we actually brought in a, uh, a, a German curator of railroads who examined this car in detail. He told us about things we had no idea about. You know, when this was built, what new additions were made to that car over the period of time. And it was also interesting that when we got this as a donation, the Polish State Railways, you know, they said, you're going to use this in the exhibition, we want this to look good, so they gave it a fresh coat of paint. <laughs> and of course, when it arrived, at, you know, at our storage facility, our conservators, you know, just realized how much work they had to do. Uh, and if someone explained to me, I was saying, oh, you know, you had to take off the paint and all of that. She said, yeah, but we had to do with objects the size of a Q-tip, you know, that it was so much work to remove it. But one of the benefits of all that is they got down to the, that, the lowest layers, to the original layer. You know, it had been used after the war multiple times in a variety of different ways. But doing that, they were able to uncover more and more information about this rail car. Now, if I can go to the next slide. And this is how it's displayed in the permanent exhibition. And what's interesting about the founders of the museum is how sensitive, the creators of this exhibition, how sensitive they were to, for instance, the feelings of survivors. If you look at it, most people tend to go through the open door of that rail car and through it and end up with those photographs from the, from the Auschwitz album. But they created, the founders of that exhibition created another path. Because they said for Holocaust survivors who were deported on trains like that, maybe they wouldn't want to go through that experience. So they created an alternative path. So that was the ways in which they were thinking about sensitivity, the power of memory, the power of memory to, to resurrect some tragic things from the past, but to use this object as a, as a way of learning. Uh, we also, and, and it's a very powerful tool for people to go through that and see the, the size of these things, people that have you know, learned about this from their education. If we can go to the next slide. What we're seeing here are shoes from, that were found by the Soviets after the liberation of Maidana uh, in Lublin, Poland. Now, after the war, uh, in 1944, when the Soviets liberated uh, the Maidana camp, they found hundreds of thousands of shoes and very few prisoners. And when they got to Auschwitz, January 1945, they found a few surviving warehouses full of stuff, children's clothing, shoes, hair, but only a few prisoners. So the question is, what happened to those, all the people? It became a very powerful uh, memory for many of those who liberated this camp, the liberated camps, that they saw these images, and it stuck with them in their heads. If we go to the next one, and these are some of the shoes in the exhibition. The exhibition shows about 4,000 shoes. 
This is the largest single collection of individual artifacts. Each one of those shoes has an individual number. Now these are all on display, these are all on loan from the State Museum at Majdanek in Lublin, Poland. Now what's interesting about this is that kind of the battle against time that we're facing. These shoes, for instance, are disintegrating before our own eyes. That is, that's part of the natural process as leather breaks down. You know, you can see the kind of ways in which it's disintegrating. And yet there's a need to preserve these. And of course that comes up in a variety of ways. For instance, not that long ago, there was a fire at Majdanek that destroyed many of these shoes. So that they lost those in, in, in a tragic, you know, fire. But the idea is, how do you preserve this, keep this? This is the most, this, this segment is the, is the segment that most visitors point to as the one having the most powerful impression on them. And in part, I think that comes from their own memories. They don't know necessarily about the individuals that wore those shoes. We don't know about the individuals that wore those shoes. We know about the history of, of that camp and why those shoes are there, etc. But I think there's something very deeply personal about those shoes. And what you see in there, you see, for instance, that they're shoes of different sizes. There are shoes for men, women, and children. And so this is something that people deeply identify with. It personalizes that story, even though they don't know anything about those individuals. It's a way in which those memories engage visitors in a very deep way. If we can go to the next slide. Now this I want to show you is kind of one of those new discoveries, or relatively new discoveries that occur. Uh, this was taken in Vienna, and uh, about 10 years, 10, 15 years ago, uh, the Vienna Jewish community discovered a huge trove of documents. They were, there was a building in Vienna that they had owned, and they were going to sell the building. They went in there to clean it up and found hundreds of boxes of documents, including this. And so the question was, you know, some of it was in very bad condition. It was sitting there for decades. It needed a lot of restoration work. Uh, but the documents themselves were extremely important. I went to, when I was in Vienna, I went to take a look at this collection. You know, some things were crumpled up in balls, you know, that had to be, conservators had to work on this. It was kind of a, a nightmare of sorts in order to preserve this. Uh, and, but this was one of the documents that was in this. This is an emigration scheme. If we can go to the next one, maybe it'll be a little clearer. Now this was done uh, by the Jewish community in Vienna, but for Adolf Eichmann and the SS. Now what it shows is the success, if one will, a forced emigration from Austria. It's a Jewish migration from the Ostmark, which is what they called Austria after the uh, annexation. But then you look over here, and it's the 2nd of May, 1938. That is less than two months after the Nazis incorporated Austria. It gives the size of the Jewish community in Vienna and how many there were in Austria. So there were 180,000 Jews in Austria when the Nazis took over. And so lists of various organizations that they belong to and also how large those uh, communities outside Vienna were. But then if you look over at this column on the end, this is less than three years later, and you see that from 180,000 Jews, there are less than 40,000. That is, for Eichmann and others, this shows the success of how he'd been able to drive Jews out of Austria. And that map shows where they went. Over, over here, it shows the uh, 
the Jewish mortality in Vienna over those years. And also, if you look at that line that goes up, down, that's the major decline of Jewish births in Vienna. So deaths have increased and births have plummeted. Up at the top, you see this kind of winding path. That shows all the different offices that Jews had to go through in order to leave Austria. Remember, the, the Nazis were very, very much interested in dis systematically dispossessing Jews of, all, of their assets. So you had to go to the finance office, you had to go to the police office, the station, you had to get all these things in order to leave. You had to pay a flight tax. You had to, if, and that started before the Nazis took over, but that was initially 25% of your assets you had to forfeit to the government. Then it became about 50%. On top of that, for Jews, there was also the so-called atonement tax for Kristallnacht. Remember, Jews, after, after the, this pogrom that the Nazis unleashed, Jews were forced to pay for the damages. They were assessed, you know, a one billion Reichsmark fine that they had to pay. Now, how did they pay it? Well, you got a, a Jewish family got a, a certificate. We have a number of these in their collections, and it says, "Okay, your assessment based on the property you registered months earlier, before the destruction, is this." And then you have to pay this off in four payments. This is how the installments go. And so people had to pay that in addition to all of this. So they used the system to extract as much capital, as much assets out of this. But this kind of gives you like a glimpse into that process. And there are all kinds of, uh, sub all kinds of documents that can be linked to this about people's experiences you know, in emigrating and the, and the challenges of that. Uh, and there were about, I think, seven different ones of these created. But today, as a result of these discoveries, the, the Vienna Jewish community is the most, the best documented Jewish community in all of Europe. So it's kind of a remarkable uh, collection of documents that shed light on this history. If we go to the next one, this is how I installed, had this installed in the permanent exhibition uh, in order to explain to people the way forced emigration worked. If we can go to the next one. All right, this is a, 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 partic a, a particular story that I thought was extremely uh, revealing and poignant. Uh, back in about 2000, we received a an email message from a woman in Poland. She wrote to one of, uh, two of my colleagues, actually, and she wanted them to help her out. She said, um, she gave some basic information. She said, I, my mother wants to know, find out who she is. And she began to tell the story of this one woman on the left. And it started out on this this woman was about 18 years of age. And she asked her mother, she said, how come I look so different from my sister? She said, I don't look anything like her. And you can see they don't really look alike. And so the mother began to tell the story. And she said, well, we, you know, you're essentially our adopted child. And so, the, the mother explained that in 1941, during the liquidation of the Brest-Litovs ghetto, when the Jews were being taken out, she and her husband went into the ghetto to loot property. That is, they went into Jewish homes after the, after the Nazis had taken the Jews out. They went in there to see what they could take. This was a common thing. I mean, it wasn't, it's, it's something we're finding more and more about as time goes on, about 
what neighbors did, what people, you know, how some people, normal, ordinary individuals, took advantage of the fact that that their Jewish neighbors were being deported and, and got things, acquired property. Well, in this particular case, they went into a, an apartment. They went in and they started taking They went into the bedroom and they flipped over the comforter and they found a baby that had been bayoneted in the head. The baby was still alive. And so they took that baby and brought her home. And so then the, the girl said, well, you know, can you tell me more about where you found me? And she said, all I can say is that the, on the apartment, it said Goldberg. And so when her, when this woman's daughter wrote us, she said, you know, my mother wants to know who she is. She grew up. If we can go to the next slide. This is her baptismal certificate, which in some ways is a kind of an interesting document because it shows she was baptized in 1954. And so that it was clear that she wasn't baptized as an infant. But uh, so this became another kind of clue in this. Well, so she wrote to us, and, and my colleagues became very interested in this. And so we started doing some, some research, and as luck would have it, the museum had copied these documents from the brest ghetto. And one of the things that was in that was registration documents for all the Jews that lived there. So my colleagues went through that and they said, okay, well, how many Goldbergs are there? So they checked, not good enough. But there was only one child that was born at the time this girl was. And that was Fraidla Goldberg. So we were able to give this woman back her real identity. But even more, those documents had photographs of her real parents. And so this was something that, and we sent her this information and, and her daughter this information, so she found out who she was. You know, and, the, and so that was not only very poignant for us, but it, was, it helped to give this person back some of her own history. And this is something that, that we, it's not a, an uncommon thing. You know, people find out you know, years afterwards that they were hidden children and find out you know, bits and pieces of, of their history. Remember there was a, one collection I wanted to include here. It was uh, kind of linked some of these stories. Was that we had a, uh, a collection that was donated by uh, the girl who was hidden, but we also had documents that were donated by the family that hid them, that hid her. And it was very moving because the, uh, the mother, the parents of that child, had all wanted to go into hiding. That they had been, they had witnessed a, one of these uh, deportation measures. They were hiding out from the Jewish police headquarters and watched as it happened, and the brutality that was, that was being shown by the guards as they were taking the Jews out of the, the family said, we want to save, we want to save ourselves. So the, the, um, the mother contacted some old school friends, her, Polish school friends of hers who lived outside the ghetto, and she said, can you take us in? And the family said, well, you know, we can't take you in, you look too Jewish. If we take you in, everybody's going to know. Our neighbors are going to know that we're hiding Jews and we're going to get reported. Because they don't, want the, they don't want the Nazis to come in there and, you know, kill them or, so we, I can't take you, but I'll take your child. And so they hid that, they hid that little girl. And, um, but the, and so they kept wrecking, you know, they kept kind of, they kept the woman's diary. She said, can you keep this stuff too? And she also gave 
them two photographs, one of her and one of her father. And she said to give these to, give these to my daughter when she grows up so that she'll remember us. And the, neither one of the parents survived. They were killed, and so the girl, you know, eventually grew up and she had photographs of her with very moving inscriptions on the back that her parents wrote so that she would never forget them. And so it, in some ways you see how you know, powerful this, this memory is and the need that survivors had in preserving that memory. You, know, you can think back at, for instance, what Emanuel Ringelblum and the others in the Onyx Shabbat archive in the Warsaw Ghetto, burying documents. They knew they weren't going to survive, but they hoped those documents would, because then people in the future would know what happened to them. So they documented everything, you know, you know what religious life was like, what cultural life was like, some of the artwork that was being produced in the ghetto. They put it, they had diary, scholarly studies, and they buried these in milk cans and metal containers in the rubble because they felt that these, these needed to survive, even if they didn't. And fortunately, many of those did survive, and we've had those on display. If we can go to the next one, this is another story of, of, of the importance of objects and memory. And it tells us a lot about the experience of Jewish survivors after the war. And what you're seeing here are two individuals, Lily Friedman and her husband. And they were both deported from the Hungarian occupied uh, territory to Auschwitz. Both survived and ended up in the Bergen-Belsen uh, displaced persons camp. And what's in, and uh, they got married. Now, if we can go to the next slide. Uh, well, we were doing an exhibition on uh, Cold Life Reborn, about Jewish uh, life in the displaced persons camps. And one of my colleagues, met up with Lily Friedman. And they started talking and, and Lily said, you know, I have my wedding gown mm. that, I, that I was married in. And so then uh, my colleague said, we'd love to have that. Mm -hmm. And she said, why? She said, that should just go into a rummage sale. <laughs> why would anybody want this wedding dress? We said, we want this, we want this. And it was a remarkable document, a remarkable object. And the story is that they, they wanted to get married, but there were no wedding dresses in the displaced persons camp. Remember these? Most of these people were impoverished. They had little that they brought with them. And, and of course, when you think about the destruction of the Jewish community, it didn't affect all segments of that population the same way. It affected very few child, young children survived the Holocaust. Very few elderly people survived. That is, they were the most vulnerable to, to, to uh, extermination because they were perceived by the Nazis, by the SS, to be, uh, to be useful for forced labor. They were, in, in Nazi parlance, useless eaters. These were somebody that could be, they could be dispensed with. They could provide an, an important, uh, important uh, uh, element for the Nazi war effort. So in the, in the Jewish displaced persons camps, there was an effort to rebuild Jewish life from the survivors. So you had quite a number of marriages going on in those DP camps. And for a time period, you had the highest birth rate of any population in the world. <laughs> that is, there was this drive to get married and reproduce, not to let Hitler have final victory. So you have, you know, all these children being born, but you had all these marriages. I remember one of the displaced persons was saying about 
you know, one of our survivors saying, yeah, her mother would, was going around trying to find a suitable husband for her. <laughs> and, you know, and that, that was just expected, that you were going to get married. And so the, the, her mother was, you know, they both survived, and her mother was interviewing suitable candidates for this job. And so this went on, and, and it's, it's a remarkable story. But uh, her husband, Lily's husband, uh, was able to acquire a rayon parachute from a German, former German uh, paratrooper. And he acquired this by giving, by exchanging some, co some coffee beans, a pound of coffee, and, uh, and uh, some cigarettes. Because after the war, there was a kind of a black market that existed. That's how people survived. Cigarettes became a kind of a currency. So did coffee. So they bartered for this parachute. And so somebody in the camp made this wedding dress out of that parachute. Well, even more important about this story was that if we go to the next slide, is that about 17 to 20 different women wore that same <laughs> That is, somebody got married and Lily passed it on to the next person. And our textile conservatory, when we, we put this on display in the, and, and, and this exhibition on uh, uh, displaced persons, and she said, you can see in the, in the garment how many times the hem had been changed yeah. to fit these different women. And so in itself, here's this remarkable piece of, of uh, uh, this remarkable wedding gown that this woman thought this was only deserved to go in a rummage sale that had so many memories tied into it. And then there were photographs of people wearing it. And this was something that it was, it was quite interesting. We put it on display. And people fell in love with that, that it was so poignant to people. I remember uh, Steve and Cokie Roberts. Cokie Roberts went through and she said, oh my gosh, this is such a powerful object. And so they wrote about it. She interviewed Lily Friedman about this whole thing. And they were so impressed about how this survived and, and what it told about the experiences of Jews after the war. And so there, there were all these kinds of stories that were linked with individual objects. Sometimes they're not clear. Sometimes when you, as in that photograph of the, the, the girls in the Jewish convent, that has to be teased out of that image. On the face of it, you might say, oh, this is just a picture of girls, you know, with nuns. But then you start digging deeper and there are layers of information that can be gathered from this. And that's important, I think, of artifacts and preserving this because there's so much history in those. But I think what we're facing is a challenge today, not only because of distortion and the, and the passing of, of uh, survivor generation, but for instance, we get artifacts from people that said, well, my grandfather, father passed away and I found these in the attic. Never talked about it. I don't know what it is. What is it? And often we don't know. Because there was no, there's no information on it. And sometimes we, we have cases of American soldiers that found things, for instance, in concentration camps. And they never talked about their experiences. It was the same thing with survivors. That they didn't talk about what happened to them, so they have these collections of things, often in different languages, that they don't know what it, what it means. And for us, it's very difficult, too, because how do you know where it was found? You know, how do you know who, who it belonged to? And, you know, sometimes, it, and so it's so important now we, you know, while we have a chance to kind of get that information, to collect it. And we do this, you know, uh, routinely. Uh, one of the things I'm very proud of that my colleagues in the photo archives do is if there's like a class photograph, 
of you know from a Jewish town or a Jewish school. I say, who else is in the photograph? And it's so that they can identify them. And I've also found the thought that it would be wonderful if we could put a face, a story behind all those six million victims, so that we could remember them as individuals, not just as a number. And I think that that's something that, you know, I think here at Grads College, I think institutions throughout the world are, including my own, are working on. And I think it's something that's uh, well needed in, in particular in, in these times. So I want to leave off here and thank you very much. I don't know if we have any time for remaining. Okay. All right. I, if anyone has any questions, I'd be more than happy to address those. Okay. Back there. Yes. Want to, uh... I was just wondering, um, first of all, thank you for your talk. It was excellent. Um, I wanted okay. to ask about um, your experience with music and how music serves as an artifact for life during the Holocaust, life post-Holocaust, and how that could be utilized as well. That, you ask a very important question. And actually, that's a kind of an interesting thing, because since the museum was set up, we always had a musicologist on staff to collect this information, or this, this music. Some of it written in concentration camps. We have a huge collection, uh, the Kuleshevitz collection, that was done, collected by a, a, a former uh, prisoner. And he collected from different camps. And so we have this wonderful collection there. And it's, you know, so it's important for researchers. And sometimes it's also important um, when we start thinking about the experience. We've, we've, we have violins, for instance, that, that were used in displaced persons camps and other things, uh, songs and things that were written. Um, and one of, it was interesting, not that, maybe it was last year, there was a French scholar came to the museum. She wanted to work on music in the camps. And in, in, in front of it, and, and she wanted to say, how can we show this? How can people, how can we show this? Because what we're used to seeing is we're seeing silence. We see silent footage of those camps. We see photographs, no sound. But there were sounds in those camps. There was music. And she was talking about the ways in which, for instance, at Auschwitz, you know, they, these camp orchestras, and what, what they were playing, when they were playing, why the SS used them, and the ways in which you could show in the camp and we actually are using, uh, it's kind of a, we're, we're doing a lot of work on how we can utilize big data uh, to give a new perspective on, on the Holocaust and experience and memory. And part of it is an outgrowth, what we were using in this particular case, is an outgrowth of something that came out of war crimes trials in Germany. There was a, uh, in recent trials, you know, they've been having these ongoing trials of, of uh, former guards at, at Auschwitz, for instance. Well, they constructed this kind of uh, model of the camp, a kind of a, uh, a virtual model of the camp. In part, they did it for a different reason. Their reasoning was, if this guy was a bookkeeper here, or he was a guard in this watchtower, what could he see? Because they wanted to be able to show, could this, when people would say, I didn't see anything. I said, well, you were here in this part of the camp. You could see what was happening here. So it was aimed to, then we said, well, we can use that for other things. And so, we, you know, we had to use a kind of an abstracted model of that and say, okay, well, we can show where music was performed. And so we tried to fit that in there. And this was something that this, this French scholar, she just published her book in French. She sent me a, a, an email saying, Steve, it just came out, you know, she was thrilled about it. But it's, this is a new perspective. 
you know, and how we can re-imagine or re-visualize the Holocaust uh, with music, with sound. Uh, I, was in, I was in Greece recently, and there was a, a um, scholar from the um, National Library of Israel, and he had photographs, fascinating photographs from Abraham Sutzkever, poet and, and survivor. And in that collection of photographs of the cultural activities that took place in the Ghetto, including orchestras, you know, the orchestra that was there, and it's like, wow, there's all this activity. You know, this could be, this is part of experience. It's not necessarily something we think about, but it's something we should think about. The ways in which Jewish communities, under all these hardships, try to create a particular atmosphere or to try to create some semblance of normalcy in these horrific times. So what you're saying about music is, is a, a crucial importance. Yeah. Did, I just had a, a brief follow-up to that is just in terms of lyric also, that there were lyrics that were written to certain songs. We at our synagogue in Washington <laughs> just dedicated a Holocaust memorial a couple of weeks ago in addition to what all of Philadelphia rededicated. And part of our dedication ceremony um, included having, uh, doing some research into what song we wanted to use as a part of the dedication. Mm -hmm. And we decided to um, use Zonit Kaimol. I don't know if people know that song, but it's in Yiddish. And so we did some research and, and, and sang that song. And, and taught everyone who was at the dedication that song, but also translated it into English so that it was able to be transmitted to everyone in terms of understanding what really was poetry and a, uh, a, a message of resilience and hope yeah, yeah. Um, that stood for a lot in terms of coming through the Holocaust experience. Well, thank you very much. I think we have a question here. And I, yeah. What do you think of the hologram technology and if you have plans to include it uh, in the museum? We actually did uh, um, have the, you know, the pinkest that, that was developed with the Shell Foundation. We had a version of that in the museum and, uh, and he actually came to the museum and met with people. And, you know, they, it, was, it was very interesting. and, and uh, the ways in which it was created so that it could be used, you know, after the passing of individuals where people could ask questions. You know, I think there's, there's still some technical things that have to be worked out, but I think it's another way in which you can preserve memory. And, um, you know, I think that there are different approaches to this, but I think it's, it's all in the interest of, of preserving memory, which I think is so crucial. All right, I don't know. Oh, look at all of it. Okay, let me go here and then. Negative. Um, in a lot of cases, not. Often we have a lot of the prints, but not the negatives. In some cases, we have negatives. Yeah, I think, you know, it's that's an interesting question. We have some, um, I remember we we got a, a donation of, of uh, wheels of negatives from DP camps. And I don't think we ever, uh, uh, I don't think we've ever developed those, but they were, we preserved those. But, uh, I mean, we, we, run the, we run the risk sometimes, at least initially, we had um, the idea was that the photographs should be shown as they were. And this uh, part of this had to do with the fact that deniers always would jump on things and say, oh, they manipulated that photograph. They photoshopped it. You know, that they, and this, this one of the early targets was always saying, these, are, these photographs are bogus. You know, I remember one of the things that uh, I still have in my head is there was a guy who contacted the museum and he wanted photographs of the Kelso program that occurred in Poland in 1946 in Kelso. And his research project was 
He wanted to compare those with photographs of the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. And why he wanted to do that, because he said that those are dead people. Those are people pretending to be dead in the Kelso program. Because if you compare them with these gangsters that were shot by Al Capone, you could see that they're still alive, that they're not like those people in the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. But this was, you know, it used to be, you know, it sounds crazy, but there are people that do that kind of stuff that, that say, oh, this is this photograph is has been touched up, or this is a this object is you know not what it's supposed to be, or the museum faked this. Um, not that long ago, we had one of these people that's been involved in a lot of these alt right uh, uh, demonstrations, for instance, he came to the museum and he had pictures, you know, of himself posing that he put on social media, you know, under things, and he says that only 200,000 or so Jews died in the Holocaust. And then he had this picture taken near the donation box, and with the sign that says, there's no business like show of business. And, you know, he posted those, you know, on social media. But so you have those kind of people that are willing to take that's why I'm kind of, you know, hesitant about, you know, touching up things out of fear that those could be a charge that the museum is, is manipulating history or manipulating documents. Oh, yeah. Okay. You pick, Naomi. Take the pressure off me. Because everybody would be mad at me. Okay. All right, let me... Could you address for a few comments about the re-traumatizing of ex with exposure to all of these terrible things that I suffered, that we might suffer, that your workers might suffer, constantly dealing with such tragedy, work day after day, memory after memory, and us here comment on the re-traumatizing and extent of it and maybe what to do with how to handle contacting with these terrible things and memories to get re traumatized and more damaged. Yeah, I mean you raise an important question, actually one that the museum thought about early on, about what you know would would people would staff that were that were exposed to this all the time, you know, um, end up being affected by that. You know, so they, they were offering, you know, some types of services for people if they had to, to deal, if they were having issues dealing with that. I think for me personally, I can speak for all my colleagues, it's a question we get a lot. Uh, but the, um, for me, one of the things that, that has really helped me a lot is the fact that we've always had survivors working with me in you know, now the number is lower, but we had about, you know, 60 to 80 survivors that would come in and work at the museum every week. You know, these people, you know, worked at the information desk. They took tour, uh, guided tours for people, gave people guided tours. They worked at the donor desk. They, they did translate, they do translations. They do all kinds of stuff. Remarkable people. And one of the things I learned from them is that that in spite of all that happened to them, they maintain their humanity. And that's a, that's a very powerful thing. You know, and I, I still recall many of the conversations that I had with them and how in some ways uplifting it, it was. You know, and at times, you know, I, I remember there was, you know, I was working on the Hidden Children exhibition and I was, I was kind of bothered by the fact that some of these kids were smiling. In these photographs, you know, even some take by Nazi photographers. And it kind of bothered me, you know. And I said, you know, that they don't know what's going to happen. And um, I spoke to one of the survivors who's also a scholar, and she said, she said, well, I was a hidden child. And you look at the photographs, and, yeah, that's fine. We were kids. Kids, you know, want to, you know, they want to experience life. They they laugh and things like that. And so it's important. I think about some of the conversations that even that I've had with survivors 
who said to me, I don't know why you remember these funny stories, these jokes that we tell. I said, write them down. That's part of experience. It's a way of you remembering your teacher, remembering your, your schoolmates. You know, these are things that you know people don't think are very important, but they say something about humanity, they say something about those people. That's a way of preserving those memories. Even though they might seem trivial, they might seem unimportant, but you know, so I've learned a great deal from survivors and you know, and they've been an inspiration to me, you know, and, and, and I learn from them constantly, and you know, I uh, um, and I always will. And so I want to thank you for that question. I think are we out of time? So thank you very much.